As a trauma survivor, I have always been interested in resilience. But growing up, I believed it was something that you were born with. Then in graduate school, I learned that it was a quality that we all possess and a set of skills we can all strengthen. Most of my resilience has come from writing and seeing myself in new ways by confronting the stories I've always told myself. The more I did that, the stronger I became, and I've dedicated my life to helping others do this work. This podcast is for anyone who wants to understand their story and how to revise it, because when we do that work, we change the world. This episode mentions suicide. If you or someone you know is grappling with suicidal thoughts, help is always available. Reach out to a peer support program in your area or connect with the National Suicide Lifeline at 988. Together, we can foster a community of empathy, understanding, and support. Are you a writer who struggles with doubts? Do you wonder if your stories are good enough? Do you wish you had some simple tricks that would make the writing life just a little bit easier? Become part of my Writing and Resilience community by signing up for my newsletter. As a thank you, you'll receive a free copy of Write More, Fret Less, five brain hacks that will supercharge your productivity, creativity, and confidence. The link is in the show notes. Well, hello. I want to welcome you to the Writing Your Resilience podcast. My name is Lisa Cooper Ellison, and I'm the host. And this is the first episode of the first season of the podcast. So welcome. Thanks for being here. Now, in most of the episodes, you're going to see me interview writers, psychologists, and healers from all over about resilience, writing, and how they go together. However, in this first episode, I wanted to tell you a little about myself and why in the world I'm doing this podcast. Now, I could start by giving you my official bio, talking about how I'm an author, speaker, and trauma-informed writing coach with an EDS and clinical mental health counseling. I could tell you about the publications I have, which you could find online, or that I've been teaching writing for a little over 20 years to a wide variety of people and of, of all ages. However, those things are important, and that's the expertise that I bring to this podcast, but it's not the most important thing. I want to tell you a little bit about me and who I am and what that's like behind those titles. So I am a trauma survivor and I have been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, something we call CPTSD. I'm also a writer in the trenches and I have used writing since I was very young to confront the stories I've always told myself. And as I have learned how to do this, I have changed my life. So I grew up in a family filled with trauma survivors, people who had hurt other people across the generations. And I ended up leaving home at the age of 17 because something inside me said, this is enough. And it was terrifying. I gathered all of my belongings into a few trash bags and I carried them with my boyfriend at the time and my brother across this divided highway so that I could move in with another family. And that is how I graduated from high school. I lived with that family. I took care of their kids. I took care of other people's kids and I graduated from high school. And then shortly after I left my hometown in upstate New York and I moved to Kentucky where I traveled with my heavy metal boyfriend. And by the way, I'm a huge fan of heavy metal. That is one of the things that I love and it is a joy and an enthusiasm that I will bring to this podcast. And you know, I hope that you bring your joy and your enthusiasm, whatever that is. So, you know, I was there with my boyfriend and I did all kinds of wild and crazy things. And I believed in leaving that if I could just change where I was, I could change who I was, but I brought who I was with me wherever I went. And the person I was at that time was someone who suffered with anxiety and depression. I still struggle with these things sometimes, but then I struggled with them profoundly. And one of the ways that I dealt with the very deep lows that I experienced was through risk taking and just being an adrenaline junkie. I was a skydiver. And so by the way, if you have never skydived, I highly recommend it because it is pretty freaking awesome. I also did things like riding on a motorcycle at 100 miles an hour and going to all kinds of cities and dangerous places without things that I needed. 
And I worked hard to take care of everybody else around me while I also was doing all of this dangerous stuff. And I used to call myself the codependent party queen of my rock and roll tribe because I was the person who would be, you know, carrying the bowl that I would have everybody put their keys in to make sure nobody was driving drunk. I would break up fights. I did a lot of things like that. And I believe that if I could just work hard enough or understand people well enough or be pleasing enough, I could have the life that I always wanted. And you know, I worked really hard to have that. And it seemed like it was gonna work. And then I faced the biggest struggle of my life. When I was 22, my 20 year old brother, Joe, died by suicide in the middle of a very public mental health crisis that ended up being the front page of the Sunday edition of the newspaper in my small hometown. Everything I thought I knew about myself, about my family, about how life worked crumbled around me. And there was a period of time where life actually had no meaning. Now, you're gonna hear this quote everywhere. If you haven't heard it already, you will now hear it everywhere. And that's something that people say about Joan Didion. She, she wrote about this in her book, The Year of Magical Thinking. She said that she writes to understand what she's thinking, but I started writing when I was very young to understand what I was feeling because as a good little trauma survivor, I had become a master of shutting my feelings down, of just being a mirror for everyone else around me because it seemed like the safest thing to do. If I never had any needs, if I never had any feelings, if I did whatever you wanted me to do, I felt like that I would be safe. And you know, when I was young, it was a pretty brilliant maneuver because it did keep me safe. However, it also was something that eventually didn't serve me and kept me from knowing who I was. But there was one place when I was a kid where it was safe, and that was the page. When I was writing, I felt like I could not only understand my feelings, but I understood who I was. So I kept doing it throughout most of my life. And so because I had been a writer since about the age of eight, I knew after my brother's death that this was something that I had to write about. I could feel it in my bones. It just seemed so natural. So I bought a notebook and I put it in front of myself and stared at it a lot. And at the time, my husband, he was away with his band over in Europe on this heavy metal tour. And he ended up asking me to go join him. And, you know, I think it was three or four weeks after my brother died, I ended up packing a suitcase with just some random belongings and that notebook. And then I stuffed $45 into my pocket and I paid for a plane ticket to Europe using the last paycheck that I had. And I left hoping that something on that tour would save me. Now this tour ended up in Yugoslavia at the start of the revolution that would ultimately overthrow Slobodan Milosevic. So this was back in 1997. And I experienced some things during that trip that absolutely changed my life, led to lifelong realizations that still inform the way I operate today. And eventually I would write about that. But when I came home from that tour, I brought myself with me once again. And the realities of living with suicide loss were all around me. You know, survivors of suicide loss live with a crushing guilt, this feeling that what happened was their fault. And we wrestle with this unanswerable why, like why did this happen and what could I have done and how could I have changed it? And it's so profound because when someone dies by suicide, it seems like a choice happened and it was preventable. And you know, we always wanna do everything we can to prevent suicide loss and that's something I work actively for. However, sometimes that doesn't work and sometimes people die by suicide and those of us who are survivors are left to pick up the pieces. And, you know, as I was living through that, what became clear is that before I could write that book, I had other work to do. So I ended up becoming a special education teacher. And then after doing that for seven years, I got an EDS and clinical mental health counseling because I wanted to understand how I could support other people and their feelings. And it seemed like, you know, that was going to be the key. I kept writing this whole time, but it seemed like these other safer paths were 
you know, more important or what I needed to do. And I loved them, but something happened that changed that as well. In 2012, I lost everything I cared about to a debilitating case of Lyme disease. I could not think, I could not read, I could not work because I didn't have the energy after a while. And every day was filled with pain and these terrible flu-like symptoms. And in the midst of this misery, I knew one thing that if I could write somehow that would bring me back to myself there, that there was going to be some healing that would happen if I wrote. So I started looking for classes and I found this mindfulness based writing class through the university of Virginia and I signed up for it. And in the midst of my misery, I told my husband, I said, put me in the car and turn on the ignition because. I don't think I can get there myself, but do that because I have to go to this class. And I would show up in absolute agony and think, why am I even here? Like, what's going to happen? You know, I forced myself to come, but do I really need to be here? And I would do the meditation practices and I'd been meditating for most of my life, but I would do these mindfulness based meditation practices. And then I would do these writing prompts and 20 minutes later, I was not in pain. It's one of the only times that I wasn't in pain. And that was an absolute game changer for me. Writing became not just a solace, but this healing modality that I used to heal from Lyme disease. Now, it's not just that I was writing and that's the only thing. I, I also took, you know, the medicines that I was supposed to take and I changed my diet and went to therapy. I did a lot of different things, but the writing taught me something profound about how we heal ourselves. And one of the biggest things that happened was I didn't just begin to change the story I was telling about this illness or about other things that happened in my life. Cause I wrote a lot about various things that had happened, but I was training my nervous system to work in a new way, which is essential because when you have complex PTSD, your nervous system is changed by the chronic traumas that you face, especially when you, that happens in childhood. So having this revolutionary thing happen to me, I studied as much as I could about creativity and psychology, things that I had started studying in graduate school, but I just had it, I studied it with a new fervor because I just knew there was something important about it. So I ended up getting this certificate in primary care behavioral health. I was able to take the Daring Greatly course with Brene Brown. So I worked with her for six months. I read books on narrative therapy and I learned as much as I could. And I also took a lot of writing classes. So I've taken writing classes, you know, when I was an undergrad and, and after that I took graduate level writing classes, but I resumed that work and I studied how writing affects our nervous systems. And I wrote essays, I worked on a memoir. And as I did this, I healed. And my life changed in these profound ways. And as I began to get better, I became really clear about what my life's purpose is and what my dreams were. You know, I had always wanted to be a writer and a writing teacher. I had, this has been a calling for a really long time, but I never believed that I was talented enough or that I had the credentials because I didn't have an MFA. You know, I would just tell myself, who do you think you are to even consider becoming a writer? Like who, who do you think you are? Right? You ever, you ever said those things to yourself? It's a common phrase that people say, and you know what? It's a phrase that keeps you down, but I would say these things to myself, but that calling was stronger than these negative things I was saying. So I had read Natalie Goldberg's book, Writing Down Your Bones. And in this book, she too wanted to be a writing instructor. And what she did is she went to these church basements and she put up a sign that says free writing class and she taught whoever showed up. And I thought, you know, I can do that. My version of that was to go to the mental health counseling place that I had worked at and ask them if I could teach a variation on the mindfulness-based writing course that I had taken that had changed my life and I did it and it went really well. So I taught it again. And then I taught a variation on that class for a local community college. And then I ended up working at a nonprofit writing center and teaching that class and also a class on writing with an open heart. And then as I began to learn more, I was teaching about memoir and I started teaching classes in memoir and the dream that I always had 
began to open up for me. And over the years, I've had the privilege of working with thousands of courageous, motivated, talented, and most importantly, resilient writers of tough stories. Some of these people have gone on to get major book deals and become New York Times bestselling authors, but others have simply done the holy work of using writing to heal themselves and their families. Now, I say both of these things together for a reason. One is not better than the other. One is about ego. And let's face it, you know, New York Times bestselling author, that sounds pretty good. Feels pretty good to the ego. But if you had to choose between that and this other sacred work, I'm going to tell you, the sacred work is more important because that is the stuff that creates deep, satisfying meaning in your life. So always go for the sacred over what eco can offer. And for a long time, I did that because I just had to have faith that if I showed up, if I changed myself, doors would open for me. And they did. I've gone from a person who wondered if I had what it took to write to not just writing to heal myself, but doing the things that the ego likes, like getting published in the Canyon Review. Well, I'm super excited about the memoir that I've written about my brother's suicide, that book that I thought I could never write, which is now on submission with publishers. I've also been at work on another book, Writewise, A Mindful and Irreverent Guide to Writing About Trauma Loss and Other Tough Stuff That Messed Us Up. Now, this book is based on the years of teaching that I've done on trauma. So I've been teaching lots of classes on writing about trauma. I've had lots of conversations with uh, writers about this, and this is based on a lot of the skills that I teach and the work that I do as a writing coach. And in order to sell this book and my other book, it's really important to have this thing called an author platform. Now, if you've been writing for a while, you probably have heard this word and you probably also hate this word. But if you're a new writer, let me unpack this for you. So when someone is going to sell a book, you have to be able to show that people are interested in reading this book. So we call that our reach. And there's lots of ways to reach readers. You know, some people, they publish essays or you can teach classes or you can become a speaker and you can have a big following on social media. There's all these things that you can do that can help you build a platform and a reach that you can grow so that it's clear that there's demand for what you have written. And as I was thinking about, you know, this platform that I currently have and how I could grow it, I got really clear about my values, like what matters to me. And if you're going to build an author platform, that's the most important thing that I invite you to do. And so these are my values. I value making sure that everyone has access to the tools to help them write. And that is really important to me because at this time, I have a lot of privilege. You know, I've been working in this field long enough that I have access to people who can answer my questions and I have the resources to be able to take classes. But there was that time in my life when I was that kid who was carrying trash bags across this divided highway and didn't even have enough money to eat the next day. And that kid had a writing dream too. So making sure people have access to information is really important to me. I also care about supporting others because what I have learned over the years is the more you support other people, the more you support yourself. And I also wanted to do something that allowed me to be really authentic. And you know, I try to be as authentic as I can on social media, but for me, there are some limits. So I thought, where could I do this? And my newsletter is one place. But I knew that having authentic conversations with people was another place, and that is where the podcast came from. One of the issues I have always been interested in is resilience. That is probably because as a trauma survivor, there have been times in my life when I felt so fundamentally broken, I didn't know I could take one step forward, and yet I did, and I wondered, how the hell did I do that? Another reason why this matters to me is because over the years, I have had the privilege of watching people do incredible things, you know, face incredible odds, take that next step forward, despite their fears, despite their doubts. And, you know, that's an important part of resilience because we often think resilience means tough or strong or capable or, you know, no fear. 
That is not true. True resilience is honoring the fact that you have fear, that you have doubt, making space for that and doing something anyway. And I really cared about looking at this and having conversations about this because I'm constantly looking for new ways to grow in this area, new strategies to teach other people. And also because trauma survivors are incredibly resilient people. They have amazing grit. And yet resilience is not just this inborn quality that we all have. It is a set of skills that can be learned. Most of the time, trauma survivors were not in situations where they got to learn these skills. And I wanna have the conversations that help people do that and help people do that through the writing process. Because when you can do that, you will capitalize on your strengths and amazing things can happen from that. So I also want to broaden your understanding of what resilience is, what it looks like, and how we're always in conversation with it. I don't like just having theoretical conversations about things. I'm very practical. And so I wanna give you concrete tools for building your resilience so that if you're writing the tough stuff or living the tough stuff, or you just wanna feel like you have what it takes, I want you to have that. Because the most important thing that you can do in your life is confront the bullshit stories you've been telling yourself. Now, if you got a bunch of bullshit stories, which I got a bunch, you know, it's important to be really gentle with yourself because you learned these stories unconsciously. Either somebody told them to you or you were watching things happen or you built them yourself, but it was largely an unconscious process Then it's not your fault. But the reality is these bullshit stories do not serve you anymore. And so the more you can flip the script on those stories, the more you can become your authentic self. And when you do that, incredible things will happen. So one of the incredible things that are going to happen is that as we have these conversations, the interviews I do in conjunction with your feedback, you know, I really want your feedback. Tell me what you think, because your input is going to help me put the finishing touches on right wise. And so in a way, you're going to be a co-creator of that project, which means you are a drop in the bucket of its success. So I'm going to say thank you to you right now for the contribution you're going to make, right? Because this podcast isn't just me interviewing people and giving something to you. It is a collaboration and I welcome you into the collaboration. So this season, this collaboration is going to look at a lot of different things, which I'm very excited about. We're going to look at how silence, loneliness, self gaslighting and trauma impact the stories we tell ourselves. And you're going to learn how self compassion, seeing the big picture, and claiming your neurodiversity can help you become more resilient and a better writer. Plus, we're going to look at these practical things. We're going to look at how in the world you navigate research when you're working on a project, how to portray difficult characters, and how to care for yourself when you are writing the toughest of stories. So all of this is going to happen in this season, and I am so excited to share that with you. I want to wrap up with a quote that I heard the other day from a colleague of mine, Trudy Hale. So Trudy is the editor of Streetlight Literary Magazine, which is a place where you can send your work. She's also the owner of The Porches, which is a writing retreat center in Nelson County, Virginia, which is absolutely amazing. I have gone there so many times and gotten so much work done. I cannot tell you how good it is. So we were having an email exchange and she shared this quote with me, which was something that she had heard during her MFA at Antioch University. So this is the quote, when writing, we are suturing our souls. My deepest hope is that the tips, inspiration and insights you receive from this podcast serve as the thread that helps you do this work. Because I already know that if you're listening, something is calling you to the page. Something is calling you to your stories. Your job is simply to show up. I want to thank you so much for showing up today to this podcast and for all the ways that you show up in your life. You are a bright light. You are incredible. You are amazing and you are resilient. And I look forward to being a part of your journey as you find ways to always write on and to always be 
your biggest, best, and brightest self. Hey writers, have you started a memoir only to get lost in a sea of stories that never seems to end or completed a few drafts and now wonder if the structure you've chosen for your memoir is the best one for your book? Or have you queried a few agents only to hear, sorry, it's not for me or worse, radio silence? You might not know this, but structure is the concept writers struggle with most. They worry about it during their first drafts and all along the way. And there's a very good reason why this happens. An ineffective structure can lose readers, trap you in an endless cycle of revision, or worst of all, get you so lost you give up. But that doesn't have to happen to you. On February 21st, I'm teaming up with Jane Friedman to bring you Find the Memoir Structure That Works for You. During this webinar, you'll discover why writers crave structure and why stories need them. You'll also learn how to assess your skills and vision for this project, explore the most common memoir structures, and find out what skills are needed to nail each one. Best of all, it's only $25. That's right, $25. Plus, you don't even have to be available on February 21st because everyone who registers will get the recording, transcript, Q&A, and my comprehensive workbook. To learn more or register, go to janefriedman.com forward slash courses or make it super easy on yourself and just click the link in the show notes. You'll leave with a new understanding of not just how stories are told, but confidence in your vision for your book, as well as a clear plan for getting there. To find the memoir structure that works for you, click on the link in the show notes, then register for this course. That's it for today's episode. Before you leave, I would love your help spreading the word about this podcast. You can do this in a few very simple ways. Click on the subscribe button in the upper right-hand corner, then leave a five-star review. You can also let me know what you think or share ideas for the podcast by connecting with me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or through my Writing Your Resilience newsletter, which you can have delivered directly to your inbox.